The first approach is the Henry approach on the volar side of the radius. We shall now take a closer look at this area and give a brief outline of its anatomy. Here we have the brachioradialis muscle with the cutaneous portion of the muscular cutaneous nerve and the radial artery. Flexor carpi radialis, the bicipital aponeurosis, pronator teres, palmaris longus, and the superficial branch of the radial nerve. This is the incision as proposed by Henry. The incision goes up a hand's breadth into the arm, keeping a finger's breadth lateral to the edge of the biceps. It reaches to the radial styloid. The fascia is incised along the medial border of the brachioradialis muscle. The brachioradialis is retracted laterally and the biceps tendon medially to expose the supernator muscle and the common radial nerve. At the point now being indicated lies the recurrent radial artery. It curves laterally around the biceps tendon and must be divided in order to mobilize the wad of three long muscles which flanks the outer face of the forearm. The extensor carpi radialis longus is now retracted laterally together with the superficial branch of the radial nerve. The deep branch of the radial nerve can be seen penetrating the supernator muscle. The supernator muscle may then be detached from the proximal radius, taking care not to injure the deep branch of the radial nerve. The exposure can be extended as far distally as the styloid process of the radius by detachment of the flexor pollicis longus, the flexor digitorum superficialis and the pronator teres muscles, thereby giving access to the entire shaft of the radius. Pronation of the arm will facilitate the exposure. This movement, however, cannot be illustrated with this model. The dorsal lateral approach to the arm. First, a brief look at the anatomy. Here we have the extensor digitorum communis, and here the mobile wad of Henry, consisting of the brachioradialis and the extensor radialis longus and brevis. The incision is made on a line joining the lateral epicondyle of the humerus with a radial styloid process along the dorsal border of the mobile wad. Beware of injury to the superficial branch of the radial nerve which emerges between the brachioradialis and the extensor carpi radialis longus. A split is now made in the intramuscular septum between the mobile wad and the extensor digitorum communis up to the lateral epicondyle of the humerus. This exposes the supinator muscle and the deep branch of the radial nerve which emerges from the supinator channel and runs to the extensor digitorum communis which it supplies. The muscle and nerve may be lifted from the radius allowing a plate to be inserted in a distal to proximal direction beneath the supinator muscle and the deep branch of the radial nerve. the posterior approach to the humerus. Here you can see the deltoid muscle, the lateral head of the triceps, the long head of the triceps, teres major and infraspinatus. 
and here the V-shaped interval between the two superficial heads of the triceps. The skin is incised along a line joining the posterior edge of the acromion with the olecranon. The lower border of the deltoid is identified and the fascia is incised, taking care not to injure the upper lateral cutaneous nerve of the arm. A finger can then be inserted into the space between the two superficial heads of the triceps, long and lateral. These are bluntly separated down to the aponeurosis. On the floor of the V-shaped interval are the radial nerve and deep brachial vessels. These descend obliquely and laterally across the deep medial head of the triceps. The medial head of the triceps must then be detached. This allows a plate to be placed on the humerus underneath the radial nerve, deep brachial vessels and the medial head of the triceps.